Good afternoon, and welcome to Protecting Your Health System from Imposter-Based Emails, a health system CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Proofpoint. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We have some interactive features today. One is called Agree or Over the Top. It's a little poll we do towards the end of the event. We also want you to send in your questions and comments as they occur to you. We will visit, visit those later in the program, and you can download the deck by using the URL on your screen. Just so you see how we are going to spend our time today, first we're going to go about 35 minutes or so with our main panel discussion featuring Todd Richardson, SVP and CIO at Aspirus, Wayne Pierce, Information Security Officer, also with Aspirus, and Ryan Witt, Managing Director of Healthcare with Proofpoint. So let's jump right into our conversation. Todd, why don't we start with you? Uh, can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, we're a health system in northern Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We've got nine hospitals, about 75 clinics, post acute care, kind of span the continuum. Um, total around 8,000 employees, um, and again, from the tip of the UP up in Michigan down to uh, just north of Madison, so most of the northern part of Wisconsin. Uh, integrated delivery network. Very good, Wayne. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything about the organization, uh, but certainly tell us about your role. Nope. Same organization as Todd. He did that well. I am the information security officer and the HIPAA security officer at Aspirus. So a lot of work around the governance and the structure of the security program, but not managing the day-to-day -day push the buttons, do the configuration. All right, very good. Ryan? Sure. So Proofpoint. Uh, Proofpoint was founded 17 years ago. Uh, our heritage and our DNA really is around uh, email security. We've evolved significantly since then, and now we are a leading cybersecurity player, and we really cover uh, all aspects around protecting what is really the most um, vulnerable attack sector for healthcare and really all industry segments, which is people. So a whole range of capabilities and technology around making sure that people are protected. All right, very good. Thank you, Ryan. All right, next question. Are employees the greatest vulnerability to IT security? If so, when did this become the case? Um, what was the case? Did it shift to now uh, this is the, the major situation we have to deal with? How did it happen, when, and why? So, Wayne, why don't you start us off? So indirectly, I, really, I think the greatest vulnerability comes down to culture. And I don't think that has changed over the years. I do think the area that gets targeted has changed. Used to be that not everybody had email, so inter the internet was new. So it became easier to attack people through their connection to the internet. But as those defenses got better, it shifted to you're allowing people through the front door of your digital facility, so now we're going to target that as a weak point. But I really do think it comes down to the culture and how people view and prioritize security. Because even in the past, if people implemented a firewall incorrectly and they didn't put that emphasis or they didn't have the governance support to do it right, it didn't matter how good the tool was. And I really think that's what we're looking at today is do people have the ability to question an email that came in that claims to be from the CEO, claims to be from a doctor? Or is the culture of the organization one that says you need to do it quickly and it's not your job to worry about the legitimacy of it? So almost a, a, a if you have a culture where there's a obey, you know, do what you're told that, you know, immediately, uh, there's no room for questioning. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's a, that's a lot of it. It's the culture of you don't challenge the executives. You don't challenge a tenured, you know, research professor. Mm -hmm. If that's you don't challenge a physician, if that's part of the culture, it sets people up to do what they're told, even if right. they may have a hunch that it's not right. 
Right. Very interesting. Um, Ryan, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think culture certainly is uh, a, is an issue, particularly within healthcare. Um, I, I think when I when I talk about people being the issue or people being a challenge, I, I think that the, the difference has been there were a lot of network based attacks three, four, five years ago, and if we would have had a webinar webinar or a panel discussion like this, we would be talking about zero day attacks. We would be talking about um, research around zero day attacks or network vulnerabilities around patches not being deployed. And, and while that's still clearly important, if you look at all the recent research in terms of uh, how are attacks, how are breaches occurring, particularly in healthcare, and I can point to, you know, Ponymon research or HIMSS data, and almost all the, all the attacks are coming in by email. And if they're not coming in by email, there are, um, somebody is doing something that they shouldn't be doing, and generally not maliciously, but they're just they're they're, they're taking an action they shouldn't be taking. So, I, I think we have seen that the cyber criminals who are very monetarily led now, so they're trying to take the 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 action that leads them to a monetary gain as fast as possible, and they've realized that it's a lot easier to learn how to social engineer and attack somebody than it is to become highly educated and um, an expert in network security controls. Um, the path to social engineering and having a compelling attack is it's much quicker, a far better ROI. So that's where we see the orientation of the attack moving that direction. Todd? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I certainly agree with both Ryan and, and, and Wayne, I think as, as, as the culture of the you know, our environment shifts. I think we're becoming more and more educated. I think in the past it was easier to uh, penetrate the technical realms. I think we're, we're as an organization, I know our culture's changed in the seven years I've been here. Um, as I present information security uh, threats and where we are and what our plans are to our board, uh, when I sit in the boardroom with uh, folks that are in banking, finance, attorneys, everybody's getting it right so it's not a new thing so there's a certainly the culture is shifting uh the culture that wayne referred to when i got here certainly was the case you didn't question it you let people do what they wanted even if it wasn't right that is certainly shifting um information security is is front of mind for my ceo um wayne and i will get emails you know five o'clock in the morning you'll see some new vulnerability coming out going wanting to know where we're at with it so it is, it's not something that's in the back closet anymore. It is front of mind. Um, as such, the technical capabilities are increasing. And as those technical capabilities increase, as Ryan said, the weakest link is that person. Um, and, and it's not top of mind for the average nurse, the average respiratory therapist. They're online, they're getting their emails, and it's, it's easy to fool people. Uh, I, I think Wayne has done a great job in our organization in education, and that really gets where you, you know, you, as much as you try to educate, they still are that weakest link. Um, but but it's becoming top of mind. So how do you how do you how do you get ahead of that? You know, not only having governance support, um, having executive support, and then helping you know bring it down to something that's tangible for them, uh, and and trying to do the things you can to help those employees. But I. I think the weak link now is the people, and I think it probably always has been at some level. Um, and, and they're getting good at uh, continuing to to penetrate through uh, those employees. And, and you know, and Ryan, I've seen some of the statistics through Proofpoint. You know that the people in the email—that's where the threats are. It's the easiest way to get in. Um, and if that's the case, I think that's where they're going to continue to try to push. Yeah, and I and I. I I think the hardening of the, so if you look at the Gartner, another analyst who measure where investment has occurred, the hardening of the environments uh, that, that we've seen in healthcare and other industry segments uh, over the last five years has been important. So that has made a, an impact in thwarting that sort of attack vector. So it is now around the people and those sort of attacks. And, and, and to the topic of this sort of discussion around imposter based, um, or you know, there's a female compromise sort of attacks. That's where we're seeing more and more um, 
the activity for cyber criminals and the types of very targeted attacks where but not the um, kind of what we call the commodity spray and pray type attacks are very they're they're the the type type of acti- type of attacks where the criminal taking time to understand who he's attacking what their what their behaviors are like what they where they fit in the organization and they put together a very compelling email that uh, represents that individual and their type of activity and therefore more likely to um, facilitate or engender some sort of response. And those are, that's where the activity now is pivoting to, we see. You also see a shift in who responds to the issue. It's a lot easier to secure an environment when you have trained security people looking at the alerts and deciding what's appropriate. When it goes to a nurse on the floor, uh, somebody working in fiscal, who's more focused on doing their job and uh, isn't as ingrained into the, that security mindset, it's a lot easier for them to process stuff and perhaps do something they shouldn't be doing with good intention. You know, we, that's, a, that's a really good point, Wayne. So we, we did some research. We, we have this, we do some, we have this term we call very attack people, which is where we look at from a, um, which, which job functions within a health institution are the most attacked. And so uh, we look at where attacks come in and we try to associate those attacks to various job functions. And we look at that from the dozens or hundreds of hospitals um, that we, we survey or we look at from a research standpoint. And we start to see some, some commonality and we see a lot of attacks uh, going towards certain functions like the nursing function. And our working theory, of course, is that they work in a more frenetic way. Um, they're touching the EMR more regularly, often in that frenetic way. And so maybe they're more vulnerable to having to work so quickly that they're more vulnerable to clicking on a link, not, not maliciously in any way, shape, or form, but trying to get that job done, being at that cutting edge of, of care, and maybe just you know being more risky or more vulnerable to that attack. And so we see, I don't think it's a coincidence that cyber criminals have also started to draw some of these sort of conclusions and therefore are shaping their attacks accordingly. All right, very good. Excellent conversation there. Uh, Ryan, we're gonna stick with you. Uh, with all the knowledge and training people have about phishing attacks, scams and cons, why do they work? Why do they work? <laughs> they work because they because uh, they're still impactful and and they're it, it's if you look at I look at the emails I receive just through my you know my personal email accounts and they're very you know I, I I'm in the business and it's still hard <laughs> to discern what is not a legitimate email versus what is a a, a, a phishing attack and. You know, my wife, you know, occasionally sends me an email. Says, "What do you think about this one?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's very clearly a phishing attempt, but it's yep. really, really compelling." And I think, you know, I'm, you know, we're in the business, we're in the industry, we have a trained eye, we're we're attuned to trying to look for these, um, look for some of the signs. But you know, all the logos are correct, all the masking of the of of the email addresses are all correct. It's framed in such a way that. Um, is appropriate. The the wording is a, is a, is, a, is 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 accurate. The message is a, is is is, a, is appropriate. So it's the kind of message you would expect to receive from the institutions purporting to re, be coming from. That's why they work, and because um, they're now targeted and they're now social engineering based. It's no longer yes, sure. You can still get the um, what we call the commodity based stuff, where someone is trying to sell you opioids or whatever, and you know, they buy it. They buy an email distribution list off the black market, and it's to tens of tens of millions of people. Those ones don't work. They don't get through the filters. Yeah. And, but but the ones that are very targeted absolutely do work because they are socially engineered, and they 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 are very compelling. And it's very hard for the untrained eye, or even I would say the trained eye, to spot the flaws in them. Yeah, they've they've come a long way since maybe five years ago when uh, I got an email from my father supposedly saying he was stuck in Turkey and needed some money. This is a man who I don't think has left New Jersey in his whole life. So I sent it to my sister and and comically said, "What's Dad doing in Turkey?" 
Um, right. It was very funny. So they've gotten better than that. Um, Todd, over to you. Yeah, I think the long lost cousin from Nairobi that's trying to get the million dollars <laughs> in the United States is probably getting too much action nowadays. Um, you know, and, and Wayne can certainly speak to it more eloquent than me, you know, in terms of what he sees on a daily basis, because he's front of mind. You know, when we get a when we get an email sent to our organization from our senior VP of HR regarding benefits and we're changing, you know, and, and it can be very compelling, you know, things that are happening, you know, you need to sign in to get your benefits. Everybody knows benefit enrollment happens at the end of the year. So it's easy to construct an email to get somebody, you know, nobody wants to lose their benefits, right? If you don't no. log in for your benefits, then rechange change your email because we're switching, you know, who knows what's happening in the back end. They can be very compelling. Um, they'll download our logos. We'll get that stuff in. Um, but, you know, I think Wayne does a good job, you know, with, with our team talking about who is the most attacked, going after and educating those people, um, people in accounts payable, people in payroll, um, your CFOs, you know, the, the normal targets, people in supply chain, you know, really working with those top folks um, to put them on their guard, you know, and it, it's interesting, the friendly fire associated with it. I, I, I get emails showing from people outside my organization. If you're a vendor trying to get to me, you've got very little hope. Because if I see the little green bar that is coming from the outside, if it doesn't say, you know, Anthony Guerrero or Ryan Witt, I, I'm just deleting it. I, you know, and so there's probably good emails that are falling into my trash just because I am, uh, you know, I, I'm more conscientious about it. But I, oh, well, you know, I guess they'll pick up the phone and call me if they need me. Well, on that topic Wait. of good emails being missed, I actually got notified yesterday of an invoice I failed to pay on time and authorize because when I first thought, I, I thought it was the vendor had changed who it comes from, and I thought it was a scam, so I didn't pay it. Well, it turns out it was just a change on their end and who they used for their invoicing, and it was legitimate. But what I've also seen is that there's a misunderstanding of what IT can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've talked to people, and when I asked them, why did you do this? Like, their view was, your, the tools you have will protect me from whatever I'm going to do. And if I make a mistake, I trust that you're able to clean it up, and you're able to fix it. It's like, you know, thank you very much for that vote of confidence. But there are certain things that when the horse leaves the barn, it's too late. It, it's out. And so some of it is having conversations with people to educate them and provide some literacy around here's what I can do for you and here's what you need to do for yourself. And there's a lack of literacy. One of our challenges we're working toward is having a security literacy program similar to a medical literacy program. How do we talk to people about security? And based upon a person's role in the organization, what's the minimum they should know? about information security. And it's, I think the lack of having that facilitates some of this behavior because they just don't know. And as these scams and other things change, we can't teach them every scam, every attack, and every con because they've got their own job to worry about. So, so Anthony, let me, just, let me give you a, a recent example of, of how they're impactful. Um, we became aware of a, of a a scam attempt recently uh, in healthcare where um, there was a, a health system who was going through a, a um, build, a physical build. They were building a new facility uh, and the cyber criminal uh, figured out who the construction um, organization was, who was building that facility. Um, they sent an imposter email pretending to be that organization sent an email through to accounts payable or whatever the finance function of that health institution saying, Hey, we're going to, you know, we've changed our banks. And so can you please reroute uh, your next invoice for the next phase of the build to this institution? And so you can imagine, I mean, they had all the logos, right. They had, they had, they, they referenced the project, you know, they, 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 they went a long way to trying to put together a very compelling email that on the surface of it looked pretty darn good. And we you know it had sent to the right people, referenced the right project, et cetera. Um, and so you don't take too many of those to get 
for to have some sort of success. And so we shouldn't, uh, one of the things that I, you know, I would want to make sure we get listeners of, the, listeners of this webinar to understand is we should never underestimate the patients and the due diligence that cyber criminals are taking to make sure they will understand their environment and how to put together successful type attack or compelling attacks. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. All right, Wayne, uh, anything in addition to some of the things you already mentioned, um, what are you doing in your health system to reduce the number of times employees unwittingly allow a breach? So there's, there's really a, a couple of approaches we're taking. The first one and the one that I think will have the most impact in the short term is providing more training on the types of attacks that certain people receive. And not to say this is all they have to worry about, but if somebody receives more credential phishing attacks versus malware attacks, trying to give them more targeted training to help raise their literacy. We've spent a lot of time over the last probably 18 months working to deploy technologies to dynamically alter our environment. Think about the people that are more likely to be attacked, but can we give them bubble wrap? So then they have some extra layers of protection. We're not trying to apply it to everybody, but something that can change so that as if somebody new becomes targeted for a more sophisticated attack, we have the data to support it, the environment itself will change to better protect those people. But then we also follow up and we provide them some one-on-one -on -one training on what to look for. And then the third thing is we try to tie the training and provide it in a way that helps them at home. That we found people will pay more attention if the training is something that allows them to protect their home network, their personal banking information, rather than just something we train them for at work. And it's something hopefully they will use more often. And if they accidentally remember to do it at work, great. But our hope is that if they build the muscle memory at home, they'll do it at work without having to think about the right process at work. So you're specifically keeping track of specific people and the specific types of attacks that they're under and then giving them targeted training. So person X is being targeted in this way. We're going to have a class or we're going to do something tailored to what they're going through. Yes. At the moment, well, we're focusing on the top 10 on a monthly basis. And not surprisingly, it's the same people who tend to show up in the list. There are people very active in the community. They've been in the organization a long time, so they've had the same email address. And in many cases, it's the, we have one physician that's very open with the patients as far as just email me, I'll answer any questions I can, and I'll let you know if it's something that needs to be a visit versus you know, you, you saw an article online and you want my thoughts on it. And so as those patients run into issues, that physician's email is out there. Now the physician's getting them. So it's, it tends to be the same core group of people. And we, we make jokes with it as far as, you know, who's in first and who's in second to offer them, kind of jokingly offer them a prize, kind of like a rotten tomato of uh -huh. you're the, you don't want this award, but congratulations, you just won it. Todd? Um, you know, Wayne, I think has talked a lot about what we're doing, you know, and that, and that is, you know, really that, that key thing. And I, and I think it's not just, um, it, it's not just having Wayne, the information security officer showing up a new employee orientation, talking to him about information security. Um, for us in the business, we, we listen to it. We have a different frame of reference. If you're a brand new employee coming right out of school and sitting in orientation, security is about as dry as talcum powder on a cracker. So how do you, how do you make it, how do you make it as Wayne said, something that's applicable um, and, and not just having it coming from Wayne, um, having myself standing up in front of our leadership team and talking about it, having, you know, having our CEO talking about information security uh, when, when it's coming from someone other than just where you would expect it to come from. Um, it can, carry a different level of uh, um, emphasis. 
uh, and, and it is important. And so I think we've, we've all got to be behind it and do everything we can to try to support that and support Wayne. You know, every year as we're going into budget, it's like, wh what do you need next? What do you need next? And Wayne's probably tired of me saying, where do you want to spend more money? Mm -hmm. um, don't listen to that, Ryan. But <laughs> where is, where, where is, you know, you start, you start that defense in depth and you start surrounding yourselves. Okay, great. we got, we got this, we got this, we got this. What's the next thing? What's the next place that's the most vulnerable for us? And where are we going to head um, uh, to, to, to put that next layer out? And, you know, keeping, keeping your finger on the pulse of, of where the industry is going, um, working with those partners and in information security um, organizations to try to say, you know, what should we be looking at next? And you, you've always got to be ahead of them. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Uh, Ryan, it sounds like they're doing exactly, uh, we did an interview a little while back, Ryan, it, uh, you and I, and it sounds like they're doing exactly the things that you are, are recommending. They're, they're, they're seeing yeah. who's being targeted and dealing with it. Yeah, no, I was going to say there's two things there that really stood out and uh, not the money side, of course, but the, no, the two <laughs> things I really liked was uh, <laughs> you, you, one is yeah you're, you're you're looking at who's being attacked and you're tailoring your um your controls accordingly i think that is a uh, that that's that's best practices as far as um we're concerned and as far as we're seeing in, in the marketplace but also secondly and one of the things that we're, um, i think is really good and uh, is tailoring the training in such a way that it's applicable to their everyday life that i think is beneficial for them in their home life and that it brings it more, makes it more real for them. And it takes the dryness of the talcum powder on the cracker away from the topic. I love that. Of course, it is a, it's a challenge. So if you're doing that, Wayne, then, you know, kudos to you. That, that's, that's really good. And that, that's something that, um, you know, if, if you're out there listening to that, that that's a really, really important um, learning point here, I would say. And to add yeah. a note about the money, on the, uh, I realize jokingly, oh, but... Uh, what we've also found success with, and it's, mm -hmm. it starts to get away from the topic of the webinar a little bit, is to use the data about the attacks and about any other security controls to help other people get budget approval. So if you can help them get money to fix their security issues, now I don't have to deal with it. But now I've also got an advocate in that department, and I've seen it where people, they start talking. And then I have people come to me un for unrelated things, wanting security assistance to try and get budget approval to fix some problem they have. And that becomes an opportunity to look at those, how people are using it, you know, uh, what they want to do with it, and get those controls baked in as part of that approval so that you don't have a mess later on. Well, and, and just to take that a little further, the other piece, and, you know, you, it's the things you can control and the things you can influence. Um, uh -huh. You can't really control things in your organization, though you have more ability to influence them. You know, it starts, the things that keep me up at night is, you know, it's not just about us and our 8,000 employees. Uh, we have vendors, we have partners, we have people. Um, you look back at the target attack, right? They got hit through their heating and air conditioning people. We have people who have connectivity back into our networks and then they have employees. So it starts to get out of your complete area of control when breaches can happen outside of your control. Ultimately, we're accountable. Um, and that's the frightening piece is how do we really educate those employees of organizations and we don't even know who they are. So there, there is that second layer that, you know, is, and, and that's where some of the technical controls can come in, you know, and, and, and Wayne and his team as we're looking at the, the building out our network with sophistication to try to minimize that and uh, you know decrease that vector. <clears throat> Very good. All right, we've been talking about money. So, I want to I want to touch on the idea of budgets. Um, so Todd, let me stick with you. Uh, you talked about needing money, wanting money. How do you adjust budgets to deal with new realities? So, if the security threats are changing, from from one area to the next, how do you adjust the budgets? And if you need more money, how do you make the case to the board? So if you want to touch on some of those issues. Yeah, you, you know, it's it's interesting. And I've seen a couple articles and, you know, the question is how much, how much, what percentage of your budget do you spend on security? 
you know, and then that begs the question, what is security? Um, you know, I have a security team. We have people who, you know, work in, you know, information security, Wayne and his team. But then on the other hand, you've got your networking guys and you've got uh, routers and switches, um, Cisco gear, you've got software that, you know, configures your ports on your firewall. Well, is that security? Well, ultimately it is. So, you know, what, what is that number? It's kind of hard to get your arms around um, when, you, when you think of it in those terms. Uh, we try to take a look at where we are, you know, and, and, and again, I don't know that it's about a specific number. Um, you know, with duct tape and bailing wire, you can do a lot of stuff, right? And so a lot of it comes down to the team and their ability to maximize the use of the tools we have. Um, but, but it's, you know, I, I think every year I try to, as I talked about earlier, information security, I think we will continue to spend more and more money on. The question is, what's the next tool? You know, and working with Wayne and, and our teams to try to say, what, let's paint that picture of our network. You know, how are we controlled? Where are the opportunities for threats and what are we covering? What's the next piece? You know, what's the next thing we can do? We're not just looking to go out and spend money. We're looking to fix problems. Uh, so starting it from that point making the business case, you know, if, if you can really bring it to a governance structure, and I, I guess at the end of the day, the, the answer to the question is governance. Um, it, it's not just because Todd wants more money and I go fight with the CFO to get another X number of dollars. Uh, it, it's about bringing the threat forward and saying, here's, here's where we are, here's the threat, uh, here's the possibility, and here's the impact. And, and then it's a business decision, you know, the, nothing like, like, not like anything else, it's managing risk, and it's here's the opportunity and here's what it's going to take to solve it. And do we want to plug that hole or not? And here's how we would minimize if we didn't. Uh, and it, it comes forward just like anything else. I, I think trying to stay away from the emotional side of it, staying logical, staying very, you know, data driven. Um, we could spend, we could probably spend all the money that we make in terms of net revenue in a year or profits and we'd spend it on security and we would still be having these conversations about opportunities for attacks. So I don't know that it's specifically about the money. It's about the problems we're trying to solve and continue to take that step, you know, track yourself over time and, and show the organization what you're doing. Uh, it, it certainly helps when you have board members um, coming in and asking you in the audit committee, you know, what you're doing in a certain area, how are you attacking this thing? And when you're able to talk about the fact that you are, and then your CEO and your CFO hear that other people are fighting it too, you, you get that, yeah, we should be doing that as well. Um, so I don't I want to say it's easy to get budget dollars, but if we make the business case, it, it, it's really no different than buying another piece of hardware, uh, buying another application to solve a problem. Uh, it's got to be um, data driven. Wayne, you want to talk a little bit about uh, spending money, figuring out where to spend it? Yeah, so definitely agree on the data driven side and one of the things i've found a lot of success with and unfortunately it took i've been working in security 25 years and it it was probably six or seven years ago that i came up with this if that so i wasted a lot of my a lot of the time in the field struggling to do things like this and what we came up with was a scorecard that gives points when you don't follow a standard or when you haven't addressed certain types of risks based upon applications. And then it becomes a governance conversation tied back to our signature authority policy. And every healthcare organization I'm aware of has some type of policy that says who can spend what type of money. And it's a fiscal policy. So it allows us to shift the conversation from IT says you have to do this, and now it's a conversation of there is this risk, Based upon the records at stake, the average cost we think to fix it, and the impact, this is what we believe the cost would be if the risk comes to pass. And based upon the signature authority policy, this is the level of management that can accept the risk. And that allows governance to have that conversation around, do we spend the money? Do we put compensating controls in place? Or do we accept the risk? So then it becomes less about IT trying to drive that change and more about gathering the data, measuring the impact, and educating people on the options 
and the potential impact of those options. And it had a lot of success with that with, in different areas to get the right visibility on the issue because prior to that, it was very easy for a frontline manager or somebody else to want to accept all the risk. Like, I've got this process. I need to check the box. I'm just going to tell you to check the box. But when you look at that signature authority and the financial commitment accepting the risk creates, it helps get it to the right level to have the right conversation about it. All right. Very good. All right. Next question, Ryan, we're going to go to you on this one. Um, tell me about what people are coming to you for. Um, is it mainly this issue? I mean, when you're talking with customers, prospects, and the like, um, give us a little more flavor for what people are dealing with out there and any kind of uh, quick low-hanging fruit you, you can see for maybe each one of them, if you want to name a couple. Sure. So, I mean, I think when it comes to um, – the challenges that are most facing healthcare from a cybersecurity standpoint, um, they're recognizing more, you know, more and more, even though we hear about, you know, the vulnerability of the network or we hear about the vulnerability of medical devices or we hear about ransomware, all really important. Uh, the challenges are still around people uh, and uh, are, that's where the attacks are occurring and are, are around people and around email. And so, you know, proof point is, has a lot of recognized prowess in that area. So when it comes to protecting people and all of the capabilities around that and all of the um, solutions around that, that is very much, you know, what we are known for. And, and more and more we're known for our threat research around being, being able to identify the challenges that are facing health institutions and why they're being attacked and the people within a health institution that are being attacked and why they're, why those individuals within a health institution are being attacked. And then, you know, some of the mitigating capabilities that can be put in place um, to, to help with those, um, toward those, those attacks. So that's, that's essentially the kind the types of conversations um, that we are, that we are having and, and why we are, um, why we are getting, um, why people come to us. I mean, furthermore, we've, we've invested in healthcare uh, as an industry segment, and we've, you know, we that, that is my role within the company is to make sure that we are building out capability specifically for healthcare. I have established a uh, healthcare customer advisory board, and so that makes that that's even making sure that we're doubling down and and, and doing all the right um, sort of activities to make sure that from a product roadmap and a solution sort of standpoint that we're. Uh, we're doing things for healthcare, and so you've seen us make investments around certain product segments, um, uh, products for for healthcare. Uh, we, we're doing some things around um, research for healthcare. Uh, we have some uh, announcements we'll make later on this year with regard to some some frameworks, etc. So there's a lot that we're doing with regards to making sure that experience for the healthcare customer is 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 really optimized. All right, very good. We're going to do our, our little fun poll here, which I've uh, just launched. So I uh, also want our panelists to vote here. You're allowed to vote, and I want you to vote. So um, here's our three questions. Um, the increase being seen in person-specific phishing attacks will cause people to become much more careful about the amount of information they share online, especially through social media. We mentioned uh, different individuals in a hospital, a doctor who may be very active and been around a long time. So the more of an online uh, presence you have, the more people can find about you. The longer you've had your email, the more it appears on d at different places. Um, so that's an interest. Do you think that people will dial it back? Uh, you know, of which that Cambridge Analytica tipping point that people are going to dial back on that kind of sharing. So that's question one. Question two, health systems will need to become much more punitive in their dealings with employees that have succumbed to phishing scams, especially repeat offenders. So how much can you let go over and over again before you have to let someone go? And I didn't even prepare that nice turn of phrase, but there it goes. Um, and <laughs> number three, health systems will be repeatedly compromised and must move their focus to business continu and continuity and recovery so as to minimize disruption. So 
take some of those efforts and dollars and put them on the back end knowing that the fence doesn't work. Why are we spending so much on the fence? No matter how much we spend on the fence, they're getting in. Let's figure out how to keep going once they're in. So do you agree with these things or over the top? Now I'm going to give uh, each of our panelists a chance to respond to one of those. So, uh, Ryan, I'm going to give you number one. So what are your thoughts on that? you think people are going to pull back or people just love social media so much that forget it, they're all in? I think it's kind of a, an age thing, right? So depending mm-hmm. on where you are, um, um, ge- it's a generational thing. Maybe a better way of saying it. Yeah, a right. certain segment of the population just don't care. They're very happy to be all in on social media. They're very happy to share their, their data. Um, they don't care about type of regulations uh they're, they're happy to violate their own phi or they don't violate their own phi your own hipaa but i mean they're happy to share a lot of that and i don't uh, unless they get directly impacted by attacks uh maybe that don't i don't see that changing too much right now uh, i uh, you know i certainly think it's going to change i think people be, would be would behoove them to be very careful about what they share um but i don't see the trend that's not the trend right now certainly as you get as you look at younger younger generations so i'm not sure that's going to change too much in the near term all right very good uh number two i'm giving to you todd health systems will need to become much more punitive in their dealings with employees that have succumbed to scams especially repeat offenders todd you you know that one or two people or maybe even more who just keep doing it they just keep clicking on it yeah, I, I, the word punitive is kind of a tough one, and, I, and we never start with that from a punitive perspective. It is an education thing, and you know, you, you know, as Ryan said and what Wayne said, you know, and I've seen some of these things. They're good, you know, and you, you almost feel sorry for people that get sucked in by them. And so I think we look at the intent of a person. You know, there's that reckless. There's recklessness, and then there's somebody who's getting sucked in. So I'm not sure it's a blanket answer. We tend to don't, we, we don't start from a punitive perspective. We start from education, you know, educating them up front, letting them know what it is. You know, Wayne's worked on, you know, some of the phishing um, um, education and putting stuff out there, turning it into a game, trying to educate people and getting them good at it and, and, and doing it from a positive standpoint. Um, and, and I think if you work on that, you get people really good and maybe they're like me, they just delete everything from outside so they, <laughs> succumb to it but I we don't we don't start from a punitive perspective you know if it were to come from that but again it's 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 intent you know and if people are reckless you know I guess you could look at perhaps take an email away from them but we we just haven't gotten there I, I think you you start with that positive side all right very good third one um going to you Wayne Health systems will be replete, repeatedly compromised and much change their focus to remediation uh, and uh, recovery as opposed to on the front end and prevention. Does that make any sense to you? You think that'll happen? It, it won't happen. I think any organization trying to do that will be out of the health business soon. And I, and I say that because business continuity and recovery are important. But we've still got HIPAA. We've got state laws cont- protecting personally identifiable information, and the, and the FTC's Title IVs, uh, they're pretty eager to throw that around. I think the key to this one, though, really is about aligning the intent and design from an information security and IT perspective. Mimic what healthcare operations does. Healthcare operations is all about risk management. It's about quarantining the, gathering the appropriate data, making the right decisions, and designing your IT infrastructure to operate in a similar way. For example, we are working towards segmentation and other things, and anything on our core network is going to be treated aggressively. If a system can't be taken offline or quarantined, uh, DaVinci robot or some other medical device, it doesn't go on our core network. But the trade-off is that you don't get email, you don't get the file shares, you don't get the internet. If you need those things, then you need to be managed aggressively. And Mm -hmm. so I think less about business continuity and recovery, it's going to be about building out the ability to quarantine, isolate, and triage 
similar to how healthcare does. All right, let's uh, take a look at our poll results. And I'm going to share those results with you now. You should be able to see them. So um, increase in person-specific attacks will cause people to become much more careful. That was split. 50% agree, 50% over the top. So maybe it is the generational thing. Ryan, maybe we've got people of different generations split evenly. Uh, so we'll see about that. Number two, health systems will need to become much more punitive. 64% agree that you're going to have to get punitive, Todd. So I know you can do that, buddy. I know you can. <laughs> I know you can handle it. Um, and number three, health systems will be repeatedly compromised and must move their focus to business continuity. 71% agree. So they disagree with you, Wayne. Yeah. So what, what are your they, thoughts there? They must have good cybersecurity insurance. They better have good cybersecurity insurance. Very good. All right. Well, um, yeah, that's about all we've had time for today. So much more we could have gotten you. Actually, I want to give you a quick minute, Ryan, for any final thoughts uh, before I wrap us up. I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Uh, Todd, Wayne, thank you for stepping up. Appreciate the, the contribution. Uh, your insight was, was very valuable, uh, and so I'm grateful for the time. And, Anthony, thank you for hosting this. Oh, very good, very good. Um, thank you, Ryan. So that's uh, about all we had uh, time for today regarding our events. Attending them gets you – one CEU towards the CHIME, C-H-C-I-O, certification program. Um, we'll let CHIME know you were here if you have asked us to, and if not, make sure you let them know. You'll receive an email when the on-demand recording of this event is uh, posted. Uh, to sponsor one of our upcoming events or book a custom event, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team, and you can go to our website to register for our robust lineup of webinars. Um, and I want to thank our panel very much, uh, Todd Richardson, Wayne Pierce, Ryan Witt, uh, wonderful event. I want to thank uh, Proofpoint very much for sponsoring this event and making this uh, what I think was a very valuable conversation possible. And I want to thank you, our attendees, for regularly coming to these events. So with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony.